I would like to open in, in prayer, if you don't mind. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening together. Thank you for this fellowship. Thank you for the freedom we have in you and also the freedom in this country. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together like this. At this time, we pray for those who are in other countries and they don't have such a freedom to get together. Heavenly Father, that you will grant them peace in their hearts and in their minds too. And if at all possible, Heavenly Father, that you will give them this peace which we enjoy so far. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this freedom is given to us so that we may use it to the full for your glory, not only in this country, but other countries too. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last night uh, talked about uh, key doctrines of Islam in comparison to Christianity, and then I moved on to the two faces of Islam. I gave you the outlines for it, and those are not just outlines, even if you just follow that outline, it tells you what Islam is all about, or the subject on which I'm talking. Today, I decided to talk about answering questions Muslims ask and bridge points in ministering to Muslims. I was praying about it, and I realized that all these talks and conversations are useless if you don't glorify God. And for that reason, I asked that we will open this session with worship. Worship is so important, so important that many do not realize the importance of it even among many Christians. We have been created to glorify Him. Even Muslims know that God has created them to glorify Him through prayers, through all the day long chanting the passages of the Quran back to God and perhaps He will be merciful to them. We, you and I do it in praise of him because he has already granted that grace and mercy to us. So we don't have to guess it, we don't have to wait for it until the day of judgment. It is here for the taking. We do it because the way he has loved us, now because we love Jesus, we keep his commandments. So that is the way I realized that we have to. So for that reason, I put this both uh, subjects together so to uh, shorten some time. But those who are not here uh, last night, I just gave you a little bit of recap. Well, as followers of Christ, we believe that in these last days, God has spoken to us through his Son. However, Muslims believe that 600 years after Jesus, another prophet had to come. And his name is Muhammad. And so it is not Jesus anymore, but that God has spoken through Muhammad. 1.6 billion Muslims believe in them. We got a big problem nowadays in the West. And that is that because of this common word, and commonwealth situations and interfaith rallies and a lot of other things which are happening in this country and around the world that let's not speak about Judeo-Christian heritage but only talk about Abrahamic heritage because we can then include Jews, Christians and Muslims too because we all believe in God, Abraham and we all believe uh, in quite a few other things. For example, we believe in God. We believe in Abraham, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, salvation and assurance. So whether Muslims, Christians and Jewish people, we are all together 
in it. And then they go a few steps further. They will say, since it's the same God, Muslims also believe that it is the same God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we believe in Abraham, we believe in Jesus, Muslims will say. So it's all the same. Not really. And I showed you last night that when they talk about God, they may use a kind of... uh, vocabulary which we as followers of Christ are acquainted with. But then, after all that discussion when goes on with them, we realize their dictionary is different than what we really believe about God. The major thing is that while we say that God is merciful, at the same time we also say, yes, he is Rahman, Rahim, but he is also our Lord. And they will say, yes, he is. But as soon as we say God is our Abba, Father, the Muslim person will say, Astaghfirullah, I ask for God's forgiveness. No, that's blasphemous to them. You cannot say that God is our Father. Now, I mentioned to you that how it can happen in their case as well. That how Satan has been trying to keep the relationship of fatherhood and we as his children away from it. So Islam teaches half-truth saying that our relationship with God is him being our master, and we as his servants only. But that's half truth. Yes, you can live with it, but the reality is that through Christ, we have been now adopted as that God's children. He has now given us the authority to call him as our father. See how difference there is. Abraham. You know about Abraham, we believe that yes, he, the promised son, was Isaac. They believe, no, it was not Isaac, it was Ishmael. They also talk about the covenant and the blessings. In fact, five times a day, in all the prayers, there is a prayer which says, Oh God, bless Muhammad and his descendants as you blessed Abraham and his descendants. Although Muslims believe that Muhammad was the descendants of Abraham through Ishmael. They believe that it was not Isaac, but Ishmael was a sacrifice that he was asked to go and sacrifice him. The Quran does not mention the name of the child. Anyhow, when it comes to Jesus, Muslims and Christians who kind of like don't want to talk about, they want to be peacekeeper, not peacemaker. There are Christians who like to be peacekeeper, not peacemaker. Peacekeeper always say, let's not talk over there and on those things on which we disagree. Just be on the surface. Put all everything on the carpet. While peacemaker says, okay, Let's have a conversation. Let's have a discussion about it. Let's see where it goes. And then realize, let's compare and stand for the truth. That's what is called, blessed are the peacemakers. So we go to the Holy Spirit. You know that Muslims believe that the Holy Spirit is actually Muhammad. In fact, sometimes the Quran is so confused in this area, sometimes Ruhul Qudus is Gabriel. And sometime when people asked him, Muhammad, tell us, so you are a prophet of God, so tell us what is Ruh? And he said, oh, this is the commandment of God. That is all. But you have been given just little information. Don't ask these type of questions. So you see, When he says that all about me, there is something written in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. He does not use the word Old Testament, New Testament, but he says that he is a prophet about whom there is a mention in the Torah and in the Injil, in the Gospel. So through the centuries, Muslims have been trying to read the Bible 
in a way to find passages so they can support Muhammad. Like in Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 15 uh, and other places also that Moses was told by God that God will raise another prophet like him so they should listen to him. Muslims believe that is Muhammad. In John's Gospel, when Jesus said, I will ask the Father to give you another comforter to be with you forever, Muslims believe that is actually that comforter is Muhammad. And yet, in the same passage, when Jesus says, I will ask the Father, a Muslim will say, Astaghfirullah, I ask God for forgiveness because that scripture is corrupted, because God is not our Father. What kind of court system you have? You take a document to a court and say, according to this document, although it is corrupted, I am the owner of this house. And the judge will look at you and say, you are out of your mind. Go and bring me a document which you believe is perfectly and then prove to me from that. So it's a big problem that on one hand Muslims say the Bible is corrupted and then they go and take portions from it. Now, for example, that Jesus said, I will ask the Father to give you another comfort to be with you forever. Muhammad lived only 62 years on this earth. So with great reverence, I will ask my Muslim friend, and I have been asking myself when I was searching for the truth, how could that 62 years be? Eternity, forever. There are a lot of other areas. Jesus said this comfort will take it from me and will give it to you. Now, if Muhammad claims that he brought the Quran from God through Gabriel, then Jesus is the giver there. Because it says, I will give him and he will give it to you. Would Muslims believe then that Jesus is God? No. Or Jesus gave the Quran. Oh, no, no, no. That is again blasphemous. So why go into areas where there is a problem? When it comes to salvation and assurance, I told you that yes, Islam teaches you to do all the works and everything, all the commandments, and even the conditional love of God is mentioned in the Quran. That if you love God, you will obey the Prophet, and whatever he says, then in turn, God will love you. But you will never know. You have to collect all those brownie points all your life, and then you realize, that's what happened to me, that here I am, that as a working student, trying to become a Muslim missionary, because that was right from my childhood, I wanted to be a Muslim missionary. First, I faced the denominationalist problem. When I recovered from that, that I want to be a Sunni Muslim, and uh, you know, like we have Catholics and Protestants, and they also have Sunnis and Muslims. Sunnis are the major group and the Shia are other groups. And like we have so many denominations and heretic groups, they too have heretic groups as well. And so that happened to me. I wanted to be just a Muslim. Like a Christian, when he becomes so fed up with all this denominationalism in Christianity, he says, I just want to be a follower of Christ. And he takes a fresh breath again. That if the Bible speaks, I will follow it. If it doesn't, then we will have differences. But that makes it more clear that Jesus is the only Savior. So we went to, through this, that assurance, when it comes to assurance, even Muhammad said in chapter 46 of the Quran, listen, I don't know what will happen to me or to you. There are traditions who clearly say that Muhammad said, listen, by your works you cannot enter into the paradise of God. But by God's grace and mercy. People asked him, what about you? And he said, only if he allows his grace and mercy to cover me, then I can enter. So where does one get this grace and mercy? That was my question too. And then one day, 
There was war between India and Pakistan. And like anybody else, I was afraid of death. What's going to happen to me? So I'm reciting all these portions of the Quran. And all of a sudden, oh yeah, God is able to use whatever a person believes to bring that person to the real truth. And here I was reciting an exposition of faith, Iman Mufassal, they call it. And I'm saying to God, the translation would be something like, I believe whatever was revealed to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Ishmael, and all these other people, and the tribes. And then it says, and I believe whatever Moses brought and Jesus brought. And then it says, I do not make any distinction among them. And like somebody said, hello, you are making a distinction. You believe in whatever Moses brought and Jesus brought. And then you say, they are corrupted. Isn't that distinction? That only the Quran is intact in which you believe. That changed my mind. And at age 21, I went and got the whole Bible. I thank God that there were missionaries, although they were doctors, nurses, teachers. But I came to know because I used to work for postal services in the inspection department, sensor board. And see how God works. And God introduced me to those people. They put their lives on the line the first time to meet me. Can you imagine that here is, you receive an envelope all the way from Finland, and in it there is a chit, and the chit says, I work for the censor board, but I would like to ask you a few questions. Would you please uh, meet me? That gentleman is now 95 years old, still support our ministry. I thank God for him from Finland. And of course, there have been other people as well. Anyway, let's go a little bit further. Then I talked about the two faces of Islam. See here, this is from Miami Dade City. On the bus, it says, Islam, the message of Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Bring them all together. And they will tell you, oh yes, Islam means peace. And so we become a little bit disturbed. What is happening in our situation? This collage tells us that outside America and some part of Europe, we find that there are people agitating and doing a lot of bad things and saying Islam means total submission, world domination at any cost. But here in this country, I, can, I showed you last night how many billboards telling us that, oh, no, no, Islam means peace. Oh. It's the other people who are doing it, not us. Only 10% people are doing it. So I wanted to show you that what was actually behind such contradiction and what is. I shared with you that it is all the way it goes back to Muhammad and the religious text, i.e. the Quran. The first 13 years, Muhammad was preaching for you is your faith and for me is my faith. If you do not want to believe in me, that's up to you. Any Jew, Christian, Azorestrian, or whoever you have, if you believe in God and on the day of judgment, no fear shall you have. That's what his preaching was. But as the time went on, he got a following, and I will not go into a lot of detail. So when he had a significant following, things kind of changed. He said, well, that those people who offended me and who were upset with me, who kicked me out, now let's get them. Then this offense started so much that he not only went against those people who had kicked him from his own city, and now he was living in migrant, but as a migrant in another city, but now when he got control of this other city, he started to take over the whole of Arabia. And the whole thing changed. People would ask him, so what happened to those all those uh, nicey, nice passages and all those things? What happened to them? And he would say, well, God has replaced them. Nothing to do with me. You know, like you have seen those workers, he say, I just work here. Yeah, blaming somebody else. So he was blaming God that he says that. And thus he introduced the doctrine which is known today, Darul Islam and Darul Harab. 
the abode of Islam where Muslims are in majority, they have taken over, and Darul Harab, Harab means war, all other places where Muslims are in minority, they have to be once brought under that dominance, whether by population explosion or whether by other ways it should be done. Of course, they have, there are other areas that what they would do is they will say, oh, uh, certain places, if we cannot take over, there are many ways to do it. Just have a treaty with them or just have a, a kind of like a if we are allowed to be peaceful, so go through. It's not, it's all jihad. In other words, jihad means struggle. It could be spiritual struggle, it could be social struggle, it could be within the situation. You take all the advantages and use them. And for that, Islam allows to be lying as well. Yes, Islam does not allow lying, but when it comes for a greater purpose, you can do it. Lie is a lie. But here it is. If you go to Jesus to Muslim, just type that doctrine of lying in Islamic jurisprudence. I have given about five pages of information there with quotes from books and other, and so are others. Just type that in any search engine and you will find that information for you. I mentioned to you that you may be thinking that, well, oh, uh, why you people, Americans, are rewriting our history? It's not just the Americans, but also Muslim Americans doing that too. I showed you how they say that we Muslims were here even before Columbus arrived. There was a video I showed you. Here's another uh, from CARE. This man, Hassan Shibli, uh, he says, Jefferson got the idea of freedom of religion from the Quran. And you start thinking, ah, if it really teaches freedom, then why there is so much trouble on the other side? Yes, you can blame the West and America, the great Satan, and Israel, the little Satan, and you can do all this always pointing to somebody else that it's their problem. But that's also what Islam teaches, to always point to others. Well, now it is in a... Your politics of America, I see that too. Always blaming somebody else. But anyway, here is in this country, billboards like this. Muhammad believed in peace, social justice, women rights. Oh yeah, they're telling you the truth. <laughs> they have the same words which you use, but they have a different vocabulary. The exposition is totally different. And when you look at the surface, you see, oh, hallelujah, praise God, things are very much happening. Please ask, what do you mean by, by peace, by social justice, by all these other words which they use? See here again, one family, one message, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad. And they're spending billions of dollars and people are taken for a ride because they know that many Muslims, you give them a copy of the Quran, they will not read it. So, because they are quite used to even a preacher will say all the things and they will just listen to the preacher and not open the Bible to see if this person who has said these things, are they so or not? And that's why we have more and more troubles we do not follow the Berean example that, yes, these people said to us, what does it mean? Let's check the scripture. Context is so important to follow the scripture, the scripture, the scripture. If we lose this criterion, which is the Bible, we got a big problem at our hand. And a lot of people are trying to push the Bible away and accept what they want to accept. But if you want to reach Muslim friends, well, you have to have a criterion. And the criterion, if it's not the Bible, if Jesus is not the final authority, you got a big problem at your hand. So please be aware and of course, I said, so what to do? Share the gospel of peace with them. See Muslims not as enemy, 
but a ministry. Yes, we have to be careful. Be on your guard, but not so much on your guard that you don't want to talk to a Muslim. Oh, they love to talk. But first, there should be. Once they trust you, they will trust you more than his own Muslim family or Muslim friend, actually. Oh, yes, this will happen. But of course, you have to be careful on certain, in certain areas as well. Anyway, share the truth how Jesus is the only way to eternity with God. That's all matters. If they don't want to accept it, move on. Talk to somebody else. See, this is what happened in my case. So here I was, I started reading the scripture at age 21 now, again, clearly finding, so what is happening, all this? I was quite surprised that the Bible was now different from me in many places. I was so surprised that the story of Moses is mentioned again and again in the Quran to influence Jewish people. Yet, the Quran mentions Aaron, his ministry is not mentioned at all in the Quran. The Quran mentions all the troubles between Moses and uh, Pharaoh. But you know, main thing is missing from the Quran. It says only nine signs were given. You know what the tenth sign is, giving, uh, is missing? The Passover from the Quran at all. So who is behind it? Well, I thank God that I found later on the answer that it is really the devil who didn't want them to know about it. That's what happened. Yes, many Muslims don't like me saying that, but that's the fact, that's the truth. Check it for yourself. Something is so important there, and you would not mention it. Something is so important about Aaron's ministry, his priesthood, the tabernacle, and you will not mention it. Yet you mention everything about Moses and other things, so much so that Aaron... Uh, was so scared that he allowed these people to worship a calf. But you don't mention anything about tabernacle. You see what is happening. And then it comes to that Jesus was never crucified. He did not die on the cross. To make him a liar. Oh no, no, he's not the liar. You are the liar actually. You corrupted the scripture. Anyway, so still we have to stand from taking up our full armor of God. Because this is a spiritual battle. How can you expect something good from a person who does not know the truth? They have to be told. They have to be given. This person has to see that in Walmart there is a big line of all the conflicts. And you can compare and choose which is true conflicts. Don't just spend your time on that porridge every day, every day. If you like it, that's another thing. But you have a comparison. You have something to do there. It's a very silly example I give you, but that's my Pakistani English. But anyway, let's realize that it is not the Muslim. The Muslim is also the prey of Satan there. And we have to pray for them, P-R-A-Y, not P-R-E-Y. I'd say, Lord, please, as you help us to follow you, help us to let them know about you, enlighten their hearts. Even if you are a Presbyterian or whoever you are, you think that God has already decided that this one should go to hell and this one should go to paradise and this one should be a Christian and this should be a Muslim, although I disagree with you on those things. Jesus gave the great commission. Let's find those elected one and bring them to Christ. If you are that much interested in that. Yes, I do believe in both uh, uh, ideologies. That yes, he has some, he has called others for that purpose. That they have to do that. Other people have been given choice. But the most generally, he has given the freedom. Whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Wow, that was a big introduction from the last night. So here I am. You know, no matter how much uh, you try, it becomes quite a challenge for me to make it simple. 
and then when I try to make it simple, it becomes more complicated. So here we are, but I hope you will understand, and by now you have perhaps understood that the way I speak my Pakistani modern English. So here I am. The scripture says, this is what we today will learn, answering questions Muslims ask, and there are some bridge points, so the two together. If you really want to know more about, there are many bridge points we will be, but I will be just mentioning some of the key. Again, let's begin. Why do we want to be in conversation with Muslims? Here it is. There is the reason. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jews, then to the Gentile. Yes. I still thank God that at age 13 I was given the gospel of John and it was available to me in Urdu language. Yeah, I read it. But you know, I realized this Jesus was different. But I didn't question that. What I questioned was, is God our Father? And my teacher took me home. He was a very nice, very kind teacher, Muhammad Ismail. And he took me home and he showed me the whole Bible and also showed me all these Christians got four Gospels. We Muslims believe that only one Gospel was given. Very technical, very convincing. And as to your question that can God be our Father, and Jesus be his son, because here the Gospel of John was mentioning to me, age 13, and he said, don't you remember Masood? Masood used to be my first name. Ahmad Khan was the family name. And so, Masood, don't you remind yourself 112 chapter, Surah Al-Falaq, and Surah Nas, and Surah Ahad. Qul hu Allahu Ahad. You should say that God is one. Ahad, Ahad, the Hebrew word as well. Qul hu Allahu Ahad, you should say that God is one. Allahu Samad. He doesn't care very much. Lam yalid, walam yulad. He begetteth not, nor he is begotten. More than 36 times a day in five prayers you recite, and now you are asking me, is God our Father? What could I say? He took me home and took that gospel away from me. Those people like you who supported that ministry, they may have distributed that gospel. Did God finish with that? No. The scripture clearly says through a prophet, says, the word that goes from my mouth will never return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire. And we have to believe, yes, we may not see the result of our conversation or giving a leaflet to somebody or even sending through the post to a doctor or a nurse or other. But God is capable. At age 15, I was given this New Testament, Gideon New Testament. I didn't pay for it. Many churches don't allow Gideon people to come in even. And yet here I was reading a Gideon New Testament the size of the Quran, but I had my own problems, and I thought, yes, the Bible is corrupted. But a day came later on. See, God does not let the seed go in the wrong direction. Yes, it depends on the person as well, but you and I have to be involved in his ministry as well. Why? Because the scripture clearly says, Peter says this clearly, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Oh yes. Please be reminded that Muslims love to talk. Oh yes. They love to talk. They, lo they love to talk on spiritual issues. So, here is a bridge point for you. While Westerners cherish punctuality, which is very good, yes, I like it. I was raised in the Eastern situation by parabolic way the teacher would start. While you follow outlines, you have a heading, there is the first line, and there is the final line, and there is something in the middle. And sometimes, 
you friends will say, sometime I like it, just give me the bottom line and that's okay for me. But you know, always those middle words which you do not read, you could finish up in big trouble by signing some document. So have to be very careful about it. So Western cherish punctuality, but Easterners cherish hospitality over punctuality. Oh yes. You go to, even now, you go to people's home and if they know you, you knock on the door and they are going to, oh please come in, oh it's so nice to see you. Okay, and the next thing will, they are not going to ask you, so what is the purpose, unless they are really, really free with you. They will ask you, oh please have a seat and then I, and they'll say, would you like a cup of tea or you would like some coffee or something and then they will ask you so what is the purpose of your coming and then the whole thing starts see this is the way so when you are talking to your uh, Muslim friend and you have become very much uh, involved please uh, do make sure that uh, it will start late and it will finish late so that that's the best way to reach them so that you will have some more time available to you. Yes, if you invite them to your home or you take them somewhere, uh, these are the words which you already know, kosher. Yes, like Jewish people are not allowed to eat certain food, in the same way Muslims are not. Uh, some Muslims have become so Westerner, that's another thing that you will know them. So they will use the word halal. and take them the best way is to give them something vegetarian yes be careful about what you uh, feed them the ingredients will tell you whether they are those cookies you are giving them oh yeah many of them are cookie monsters too but they want to sh make sure that the cookie they are eating uh, is not made of uh, some pig lard l a r d okay Yes, it is L-O-R-D for the Lord, but that Lord is different. <laughs> okay, so as I said, Muslims love spiritual conversation and some even to the extent of dialogue and debate. Oh yes, Muslims too like, they too like religious jokes, but be careful in the beginning. Never make any joke about Muhammad or about Jesus. Yes, you can do things about denominations and all these, you know, we got Catholic jokes and Protestant jokes and even a uh, lot of other jokes. For example, this one about the last days. Here's this man. He has a stand, non-profit coffee stand, and this fellow, the Christian, comes and he said, have any mid-trip ready? <laughs> You know what is happening. And the fellow has post-trip coffee and pre-trip coffee. And here comes the joke. He says, sure, coming right up. And he's mixing the two together for you. Oh, Muslims also have jokes too. Here it is. But you have to know first, Sunni is the major group of Islam. And... Shia is the second smallest group and it is from the Shia, from the Sunni people, the Shia came out. Like the Protestant came out of Catholic Church, in the same way they come. So here is a joke for you. How do you tell a Sunni from a Shiati? The answer, the Sunnis are the ones with the Shiati blown out of them. And here is, you know, the word Sunni. Here is an English joke for you. Muslims, American here in this country. Don't call me Sunni. I am a Shia. <laughs> you know what says Sunni? <laughs> Would you do this for me? Okay. Here is something more for you. God is saying something to her. And she says, well, his beard was like, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, oh God. Anyway, uh, let's leave that alone. Wife is asking, honey, do you see me in your dream? The husband says, no. Wife asks, why not? The husband 
says, I read Ayatul Kursi before I go to sleep. No, Ayatul Kursi, see, if you don't know the Quran, then it's more about God's glory and about, and there is an indirect reference there which kind of like ask you not to be thinking about women. Because Muhammad said that when a woman comes in front of you, it's the devil coming in front of you. Oh yeah, there are traditions. So much so, so much so, so much so, that a Muslim man, if he is praying to God, and the tradition says, if a donkey, a dog, or a woman passes in front of him while he's praying, he has to stop his prayer and start again. And his wife, the youngest wife, Aisha, she was a little bit stubborn too by now, and she said, Oh, so now you have equal lust with donkeys and with the dogs. So you see, all this is, uh, yes, they do have jokes. But it depends. Culture always, and whatever background we have, always influences our jokes as well. Here's another joke for you, and I will stop with that. The jokes will be stopped. Uh, he's giving an interview to some some foreigners, uh, Osama bin Laden, and he, he was asked, uh, do you have some jokes? He says, I was going to make a Muslim joke, but they always blow up in your face. <laughs> oh yeah, so they, and these are on their televisions and other, uh, they will tell you this. When you talk to, as Christians, to Muslims, please be reminded that modesty is the good policy. Your clothes and mannerism is a big issue. Muslims are always judgmental in that, especially for the ladies. You have to be very careful about those things uh, as well. Now, I want to share this with you, that usually men talk to men and women talk to women. But if it happens, you become very much acquainted with the family, then they will leave those restrictions. But in the beginning, you have to be careful. And if you are a lady talking to a man, especially the husband of your Muslim friend, be careful. Because she may start thinking you are in a, in a way perhaps trying to uh, I was just going to say kidnap him. Uh, you are trying to take away him from her. Or the man is thinking, he could be wrong, the man is thinking that perhaps uh, you are more interested in him. So this is why it's much better to be uh, men talk to men and women talk to women. Or if you find s signs of those things, then please, Please ask a brother or other sisters with you too on those occasions as well. This is the American situation. But in other countries, you have to be very, very careful about these things. Anyway, but at the end of the day, ask the Lord what he is asking you. There are many colleges and universities where... Uh, your children, your brothers, your sisters are rubbing shoulders with Muslims. And so, especially Karen is facing nowadays quite a big problem, and that is that she finds many, many Christian women now, because they are Christian, the Muslim men like them. Oh. Oh, they will go for a Christian woman to, uh, I was just going to say adopt them, to, <laughs> to marry them. And uh, so one has to be very careful about these things. We have leaflets about that you should not be unequally yoked. You should know what you are getting into. So these are some of the things. When you are talking to them, please respect scripture. Don't put the Bible in front of them on the floor 
or kind of like uh, treat it as like it's just another book. Have you seen Jewish people how much they respect? Muslims respect the Quran so much that they will put it aside and then they forget about it uh, really on the top. But they do read it, recite it, and they will wash their hands and all this. Uh, you don't have to do that, but uh, in front of them when you are reading the scripture, it's much better to have the scripture which is not kind of defaced. And it would be a good idea. But if they have become more Americanized, that's another thing. Uh, that, uh, so the, in that, I know that many Americans are animal lovers. They have dogs and cats. Muhammad liked cats. But he said that Angel Gabriel would not come to the house, or angels do not come to those houses where there are dogs in unless the dogs are kept for security purposes, but not inside the house. There are these things. There is a, re there is a, a tradition uh, mentioned in uh, Sahih Bukhari and also in other places as well, that Muhammad was a little bit surprised that for the past five, six days, Angel Gabriel was not coming in the night at all. So he realize what's happening, what is actually happening, he couldn't understand. But then one day, his wife was cleaning the room and found a dead puppy under the bedstead. Whether true or not, but that's... So she cleaned the room and that very night, Angel Gabriel appeared and then Angel Gabriel told Muhammad that when a house has a dog, God's angels don't come there. So these are some of the things. That's why they have, when a dog touch them and they are kind of very religious, they will go and wash them again to perform their prayer. And it depends. So please be careful about in front of them, if they come to your home and you are petting your dog and all this, just be careful. But not all Muslim Americans are like that, or American Muslims, whichever they want to put it. I don't, I don't like these words when people use that way to express themselves. But that is, now the ball is in your court. Bridgepoint, oh yeah, you know that I'm a Muslim, I love Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Oh, that's very good. So tell me, what do you know about Moses and what do you know about Jesus? You can be an apprentice learning on the job, there. And then find out what that person is saying and relate. Okay, you believe in Jesus, but do you believe that Jesus gives us assurance of eternal life? Jump into that area. And just start asking questions further. Muslims love to ask questions. Usually these type of questions will come to you. Why don't you believe in Muhammad and the Quran? Oh yeah, a Muslim, he will ask you. Here is a friend sitting and ask him, he will tell you that as well. They will ask you this question. Why don't you believe in Muhammad and the Quran? Because by doing that, you will actually complete your faith, they will tell you. And then here, I believe in Jesus as a prophet of God. This is a Muslim telling you. Why can't you believe in Muhammad as the final prophet? Here's another question. Why don't you become a Muslim? Here's another one. Why do you believe in Trinity, three gods? That's blasphemous. How can Jesus be the son of God? Jesus was not really crucified. The Bible has been altered, corrupted. Why is Jesus the only way? It's not Jesus the final, it's Muhammad the final. So what are you going to do at that time? May I suggest and give you this, that please, there are some basics to follow in this. Yes, God can open the mind and the heart, but here is some basics in asking the Lord, what should I do? Try to get to understand what a Muslim has in mind when asking such questions. Otherwise, our answer right away might be misunderstood. The best thing is, you know, learn from your politicians here. When they are asked a question, they will say, would you please repeat that again? Well, what do you mean by that question? But you are sin 
And so, so what is it that actually persuaded you to ask me this question? And so the person will tell you the background of it a little bit. That will give you more room to understand the way that person thinks, the way that person can understand, and if that person has more trouble there, that actually you do not believe what that person perhaps has met uh, somebody else before, like Jehovah's Witness or Mormon or others. Oh yeah, they too have a lot of Mormons and uh, Jaws witnesses too. They don't call them Jaws witnesses and Mormons, but uh, there are. They are called kind of like non-Muslims. But anyway, we will leave that. So please, that's one thing. Never be shy to ask to explain. Can you please tell me more about it? What is it that persuaded you? Remembering this, it is the Lord who convicts the hearts and minds. Oh, I thank God that these missionary friends were so kind to me. They not only put their lives on their line to talk to me about Christ and to ta help me to understand, but they never pushed me to become a Seventh-day Adventist or a Methodist or this, that, or that, or that, although I was seeing it all. And they could speak my language too. It'd be nice if you could speak their language, but if not, they speak English nowadays as well. English is spoken a second, but if you don't understand, just let them. Would you please explain it to me a little bit more instead of uh, misunderstanding it? So do think about this. Okay, here we go to the question. Why don't you believe in Muhammad and the Quran? How would you answer? What do you think about that? Oh yeah, you may get their attention for a little while, and it's the truth, but it's a problem. You have right away offended a person the first time you have met. Oh yes, it's truly factual. No problem with it. So, what do you do? You try to scratch your ear like this. Well, such a dealing will not win a Muslim right away to the truth. First, you have to build up that area. So, this is the way you may do. You know, you have more chances to reach Muslims than a person like me. Why? Because I'm an apostate. Muslims are not allowed to talk to apostate. They should be killed. But if you can't kill them, then you don't talk to them. So, no matter how much good I may say, unless they want to... I'm a failure. This is why we, I go around and even locally to help brothers and sisters like yourself that you have more advantage to reach them. Why? Because Islam is also a missionary faith. While you are talking to them about Christ, they are talking to you about their faith to convert you so to get some brownie points to get into the paradise of God. This is why many Muslim men will marry Christian or Jewish women thinking that that is also a good thing because Muhammad has said, populate. And because of doing that, she will one day become Muslim or even if she doesn't, the children should be brought from that marriage as Muslims. Yeah, she's allowed to be a Christian and Jew and all that, but children should be brought up as Muslim. So I have increase the number of Muslims in the world and God will give me some brownie points. Perhaps he will be merciful to me and I will enter into the paradise of God. That's the way they think. So this is the way I would say, I appreciate that you believe in Muhammad as your prophet and in the Quran as your sacred book, but I believe in Jesus as my savior and the Bible as the word of God. You just put your apostle creed there and then. The Muslim will say, I believe in Jesus as a prophet of God. Why can't you believe in Muhammad as the final prophet? These are conversations which has taken place. I have seen this, people talking. Even I did that with Christians as well. And so, it may happen in totally in a different way. The Muslim has already seen Jesus in his dream. 
don't tell me that the visions and dreams have stopped and the Holy Spirit is not working anymore. He only works. Yeah, that time he showed up to Cornelius' house, but not nowadays. Please don't tell me. Yes, many churches mention about God and they mention about Jesus, but they don't mention about the Holy Spirit and his working. It is a problem. It is a big problem. And in these last days, it is the biggest treachery which is happening in the Christian church that when people do not mention about the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon people, even those who have not known this all, and all of a sudden, they see visions and dreams. Why? Because God knows their hearts to tell them about Christ. Like Cornelius was asked, yes, he was a good man. He did a lot of good things, but God still wanted to perfectly put him on the very line that he had to believe in Jesus. And so Peter had to go and tell him. So don't tell me that a Muslim is a very religious person. He performs his prayer. He's much better than me because I only pray five minutes in the morning and then I come home and before I go to sleep, Lord, help me all this. Ugh gone. And then the next morning, oh, I have done that. Yeah. I have done that. She knows. But then I'm reminded and reminding a good thing, Paul mentions it, Peter mentions it, that although you know these things, I want to remind you. So I thank God that he brings other brothers and sisters, wives and fathers and mothers, that they Keep us on the line. So don't be upset when next time your hubby or your spouse and hey, you have so many words for these and your other half tells you, honey, what happened? You're still asleep. We were praying. So, okay, enough for that. Well, we have to answer you believe in Jesus because I'm told, and be honest about it if you have not studied the Quran, because the Quran mentions him. There are English translations available in this country. Yusuf Ali's translation is treated as the best translation. Read it. It's very haphazardly put together and sometimes you will feel really terrible about it. Uh, but we have some copies there and uh, if you want to just check it out, it would be nice. Or you can go online and uh, type Holy Quran and uh, it will, there will be an English translation, you can see. So, Muslim will say Jesus and Moses predicted the coming of Muhammad. You know, you don't have to do a lot of research. There are leaflets and booklets. I'm not mentioning it because I wrote it. But I can take the responsibility what I have written. So that's why I'm mentioning it. And so here is a leaflet for you. Did Jesus promise Muhammad's coming and he tell you? But please, like last night, I reminded you, never give a Muslim a booklet, a leaflet, just because I told you or somebody had told you. Please read it before you pass it on. Because if that person comes back and say, on such and such page, this person says this, this. And you say, oh, I didn't read it. Somebody gave it to me, so I passed it on. You know, you have got a problem there. So please be aware, and also be aware there is so much going on. Our Seventh-day Adventist friends have written a lot of things to reach Muslims. Jehovah's Witnesses have written, there is a leaflet called Paradise on this Earth for Muslims. So be careful what you read and give to a Muslim friend. Yes. Okay, here's another one. A prophet like Moses, we have... Uh, a response to it as well. And then I wrote this book, Jesus or Muhammad, The Question of Assurance. And there is a whole chapter on it. You know, there are prophecies which we believe are about Jesus. And Muslim scholars go and quote from there to tell you that these people, that these people who had written all these things, yes, one, they are corrupted, but we can still prove to you that they are about Muhammad. Can you imagine Isaiah 53, they will quote to you that, yes, it's about Muhammad. So there are some 
more information there. Why don't you become a Muslim? I understand that the Arabic word Muslim simply means a person who has submitted, surrendered himself to God. Well, I have already surrendered myself to God. You can say that. See, today you came to know what the word Muslim means. Islam means submission, although some will say it means peace. And a person who follows Islamic religion is a Muslim. But, well, you have your own dictionary. I have my dictionary of that word Muslim for you. I have submitted myself to God through Jesus. Well, here's a leaflet for you, the story of submission. It tells Abraham submitted himself to God. So was Moses. He could have lived in the palaces of Pharaoh. But he submitted himself to God. And so was Jesus. And so following the example of Jesus, I am a follower of God through Christ by submitting myself to his will. See how easy it is. Pin it on the scripture again and again and again. And that's where, okay, here it is. Why do you believe in Trinity, all these three gods? Ask them, what do you mean? What do you mean? Some Muslims may have no idea. You know, we have wishy-washy Christians. Muslims also have a lot of wishy-washy Muslims. They know nothing about the Quran. Whatever the priest, the imam would say, they would follow. This disease is on both sides, among Christians, among Jews, and also among Muslims. So do ask them. But for yourself, here is the information. Muslims accuse this, and the Quran says, Surah means chapter of the Quran, chapter 5, verse 73, God is the third of three. Do not say three. Wala taqulu salasa. Chapter 4 of the Quran, that why don't say. Now, you should ask. So, what do you mean when you don't like this word Trinity? Ask, what do you mean by three? Well, let me share this with you. This is what the Quran says in chapter 5, that on the day of judgment, God will ask Jesus, did you say to people, take me and my mother for two gods beside God? And he will say, no, I didn't. So, the conclusion then comes for you and me, what the Quran is condemning is a trinity made of God, Mary, and Jesus. Well, we do not believe that type of trinity. The Bible nowhere says. If somebody believes, and he will say, oh, the Catholics do, and all this other thing. Leave the conversation away. Just say, the Bible does not say that. So, of course, I declare this like this. I believe in one God who has revealed himself in the scripture as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Share that we only know as much as what Jesus revealed. And the great day is coming. In his presence, we will know more about him. We don't have to know everything. What is important for us has been mentioned to us. So why do you believe that uh, Jesus is the Son of God? Because the Quran says that most gracious has begotten a son. Assuredly, they utter a disastrous thing. This is what the Quran says. So you should not say Jesus is the Son of God. Remember when I mentioned to you from Surah 112, even a child has been given this um, to memorize from childhood. I remember as a six years old child reciting this, he begets not nor he is begotten. And here's another reference in chapter 5. Indeed they blaspheme who say that God is the Christ son of Mary. Oh, you must be thinking, how are we going to answer that? The Messiah, son of Mary, was nothing but an apostle, they would say. Here comes the crunch. Glory be to him, he is about having a son. Chapter 4 of the Quran. But here is the final, the lining point. Chapter 6 of the Quran says, and it reasons, how can God have a son when he has no consort, no wife? Now, Christian friends, do you believe that God had a wife and then Jesus was born? No. That's the accusation. That is the indirect saying of it. How can God have 
a son when he has no wife. In other words, God cannot have a son without that situation. He could create Adam and from him Eve. Can't he create into this world to manifest instead of being everywhere his presence? Now he incarnates the word through Mary into this world. The incarnation happens. If we believe in the presence of God everywhere, then why can't we believe in his manifestation in the Old Testament we see again and again? And then the manifestation here. See, God is everywhere. When he created Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter, we see all those areas there. That God would walk with who? Adam and Eve in the afternoon having British Victorian tea. <laughs> Forgive me, that half comes from living in the country of Britain for 23 years, so it comes. Yes, at least you are very, very clear. I usually say that in Britain, when they want to get rid of you, they would say, Stephen, would you like a cup of tea before you go? Here in this country, they clearly say, tomorrow I have to work, so goodbye now. <laughs> At least you can understand that. But anyway, so here is a situation. Now, let's remove Mr. Nene. The Bible nowhere speaks of God having a wife. Father and son need not to be construed in a literal way. The angel's testimony, see, pin it on the scripture. On the scripture, angel Gabriel comes and says, the holy one to be born will be called the son of God. And compare it quickly with the gospel of John. Because Muslims do believe Jesus is the word of God and the spirit from him. Now if Jesus is the word of God, then God is eternal. Muslims believe God is eternal. Then his word must be eternal. That's why they say the Quran is eternal because it's the word of God. What about the living word of God? Jesus. That's where my mind started changing thinking. Islamic dilemma and a Muslim. Uh, Islamic dilemma and a Christian answer. Here. A Muslim say that God is al-batin. He's hidden. The word al-batin, that's his attribute. He's hidden. We also say, yes, he's hidden. But as the Bible say, he is a zahir. He has revealed himself. A Muslim have no idea how to say a zahir. How to prove that God is also a Zahir? They say, well, he has revealed his will through the scriptures, through these prophets to us. But the Bible has clear answer that no one has seen the Father, but it is this Jesus, he has revealed him to us. Jesus is his a Zahir revelation. A Islamic dilemma and a Christian answer. So here, see, if Muhammad said something to you to do, would you not do it? Oh yeah, I will. Here is Jesus, who was called by God in chapter 3, this is my son. He himself, at the transfiguration, God again says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. What about Jesus himself? In chapter 16 of Matthew, open the scripture, pin it on the scripture, write down these things if you don't know. We will help you with this. And open there, and it says, see here is the transfiguration. There is Peter, John, James, and they hear this voice, and the voice says, what? This is my beloved son, listen to him. A direct reference back to Deuteronomy. This is why Jesus said, if you had believed Moses, you would believe in me because he wrote about me. See, these are all the things about Abraham. He says, before Abraham was, I am. He saw my day and was glad. Do you know that in Islam, they still celebrate a festival in the memory of Abraham's 
sacrifice. And the Quran says in chapter 37 that God said we ransomed Abraham with a great sacrifice. Wait a minute. Wait a minute here. When God says we ransomed him with a great sacrifice, that sacrifice which was given by God, the ram, that was in the place of son. Whether it was Isaac or, but we believe it was Isaac. The Bible is totally clear. But anyway, don't go there. And say, here is a dilemma. Then it says, we ransomed him with a great sacrifice. Who? Abraham. You know, as followers of Christ, we have the answer. Before Abraham was, I am. He was glad to see my day. Abraham believed something was coming up. If he does not believe, that's up to him. Here is the situation. Christian understanding of Jesus being divine is not that the son of Mary became equal to God or we believe that a mere son of Mary became God. Oh, no, no. That's their problem. I have checked this again and again with Muslim friends. Even I myself believe that as well. How is it possible that a mere man goes to be called equal to God? Then I realize, wait a minute. This is the other way around. And that's what happened. Yes, that he became the son of Mary, the son of man. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 9. Before he came to this earth, he was already equal to God. Through him, everything was created. And since we lost everything through first Adam, he sent this word of God as the second Adam into this world to put this construction company together again to join us back to God. He could have easily said, Send the demolishing team. But he didn't. He said, okay, let's renew them. Let's renew this construction. And that's what happened. If God is eternal, his word must be eternal. Here is a leaflet for you. God has no wife. If you want to know more, go to this website, itl-usa.org, and you will find uh, an article there, Who is God? And it will help you. What about the crucifixion? Well, Muslims have only this one passage in the Quran which causes this problem for them. They did not kill him nor crucified him. And when you check the context, context, context always matter. It says the Jewish people who say we kill him, they did not kill him. Now you know and I know according to the scripture, even Jesus said to the pilot, unless it had been given you from above, you have no hand on me. He voluntarily came to this situation. And so it was not in that way we can say. Now here, what about the Bible? What about Jesus telling us one after another that it was going to happen to him? So we have to listen to the scripture which comes before the Quran. They don't want to accept it. That's up to them. Show prophecies of the Old Testament. You know that indirectly denying the crucifixion, you are having a problem to deny all these prophets that they were liars. You got a big problem. You take, it's like a Lego game. You take one out and the whole thing comes down. Jesus himself predicted his suffering, death, and victorious resurrection. You know, there is a compassion that offends God. Muslims will say, how is this possible that God will allow an innocent prophet to be killed? Compassion. You know, there is a compassion which offends God, and it offended Jesus as well. What did Peter do? One minute, he said, you are the son of the living God. In Matthew 16, he said, you are the son of the living God. And then Jesus says, you know, this has been revealed to you by my God, the Father, in heaven. And you have said it right. And then Jesus mentions what is going to happen to him. He will be crucified, he will die on the cross, he will be buried, and then he will rise again. 
Uh uh, no, Master. Rabbi, that should not happen to you. May I speak to you? This is very much insulting, isn't it? You should not be doing this. What did Jesus say? Compassion that offends God. But he was looking at all this suffering, but he was not looking at the victorious resurrection to defeat sin, to defeat death. There are times that we become so involved to be so compassionate that we forget about the spiritual gospel and we go for the social gospel, which is, yes, very good. But if you forget this, yes, we should be both. We have to not only give the person a fish, but also teach them to fish, but at the same time talk about that eternity, that eternal food which God gives, that eternal thrust, thirst which will be fulfilled and given. And people will be satisfied. We should do that. That's what happened in my case at age 13. The whole country was in chaotic situation in 1964. Oh, you, you, Johnson was ruling here after the death of Kennedy. And they sent all this food because it was an agricultural disaster in my country. So much so that a lot of children were even dying because of malnourishment. And this food arrived, but they not only gave food, but also if somebody wanted the portion of the scripture as well. Now when I look back, I thank God that they not only brought that social gospel, but also they brought that spiritual gospel, that social gospel, that food, maybe in 24 hours or 36 hours is gone, but this eternal food which they shared with me, it's still living in me. And I thank God for that, that person I want to see on that great day. This is what, there are times that you will do things for the Lord, you may not know the result of it. By even saying to some that God loves you. And who knows, that person was going to just commit suicide and gone. And he didn't tell you, he doesn't know you. I say, oh, wait a minute. You may not know what the situation of that person is. That's why we have to be very careful when we are, whether it's in Walmart or whether it's in Home Depot or whatever place we are, we have to be careful what the other person, why he cut you off and gone. We have to be really careful. I beg of you, in these last days, Satan is trying his best, but we have to try our best, especially when the Holy Spirit has been granted to us, who is living in us, and who says, I will guide you, I will help you. Who say, no, let me deal with this tearing. When I need you, I will ask you. Why don't we begin every day with his, with his power? And then we will see how things happen, how it has happened. Oh yes, even if I had gone at that time, when my father asked me to come home and tell us what has happened, I didn't want to go. I knew there was something going to happen, but the Spirit of God convicted me to go. And so here is my father asking me all these questions. What was wrong with Islam that you left it? And there are about almost 200 people outside jeering, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Qatil Kardo, kill him, he's an apostate and all this. And my father is saying, if you were a robber or a thief or a murderer, it would not have brought that much disrespect to us as by becoming a Christian you have. So what was wrong with Islam that you left it? You know, those were the times that when the Holy Spirit just calm you down. And here I said, uh, I'm sorry I cannot answer this question, but I will share with you why I follow Jesus. Because I found that it was grace already available to us through him that I accepted. There was a Muslim imam priest sitting and he said, hmm, I smell those diapers from my hand. 
you who were born yesterday. One of my mothers who was sitting on the other side of the curtain shouted, you never changed his diapers. Well, that made a big case there. Father said, shut up, there are men talking here. But what I'm saying is that here I laid the case. And I was feeling like, you know, when you have flu and you have taken a lot of Benadryl, empty mind, like peaceful, that's why it was I feeling. So they put me, they performed my prayer, uh, the funeral prayer. They announced me that I should not use my family name, Ahmed Khan. And the next thing was they brought me out, blackened my face, and put me on the donkey carrying revolvers and all these other guns is just un not unusual. But having a sword, there is something going to happen. They put me on this donkey and my father said, hmm, you are Jesus sat on a donkey, nor a camel, nor a horse. Can you imagine when they become so upset? What Jesus they are talking about. Jesus, the prophet of God, the word of God, the spirit of God. And yet now they are saying this. This is all satanic actually. And here he is saying all this. And he raises his hand to chop my head off. That this donkey acts like a horse. Kicks a few people. The circle breaks and it takes off into the field and turns quickly to the left into this dry stream. One mile down is the river. And I hear these voices, where is he gone? What happened? Where, where is he gone? Where is he gone? Catch him. Where is he gone? And I see that behind me there was this fog rising. You know in the morning when you have this, well it was not the morning, it was an afternoon. And I had just passed it. There was nothing there. And you tell me, friends like at Churches of Christ and others, they say, oh no, no, miracles cease to happen. Please forgive me. I don't want to be sarcastic. But when you are diluting the miracles of God and the word of God. Yes, this scripture is there. Any miracle or any prophecy, any words people give, if they contradict this scripture, don't accept it. Because the Bible is the criterion. But yes, in the case of James, he was right away killed. You know, the book of Acts. You also know the story of Peter. Peter was sent to be rescued, to live a few more years. We cannot put or take away ourselves from our lives. Our coming and our going is in his hand. We have to glorify him, whether it's for one minute, and the next minute we are gone, or whether for the remaining our lives. That's what we have to do. Otherwise, let's use whatever resources are available to us for his glory. And those which are not available, please don't wait. Oh, I'm waiting for my retirement and then I will go and work for the Lord. Oh, I have heard these things. Yeah. I thank God that right from childhood I wanted to be a missionary. First I was thinking to be a Muslim missionary. I still remember about six years old boy, and this in the mosque I was studying, and they say, children, today a missionary will talk to you. A Muslim missionary gone from Pakistan to Sierra Leone in Africa, and came back, and now, like children, he was telling his stories to us. And there and then I decided that I would be a Muslim missionary. Yes, down the road, as age 15, I realized, oh, we got a big problem. There are Sunnis, there are Shias, there are Ahmadiyya and all this. And they all call all these things. So who am I? And I decided to be a Sunni Muslim. Left home and started as a working student and realized that, oh, okay. And God introduced me to people who somehow became like fathers and mothers to me. In a society where children are kidnapped, children are used for sexual trade and all this. And believe me, right from my childhood, 
when I grew up, I learned the, the bad things which happen to children. And I said, Lord, this is all strange to me. I never went through. See how God does. In Islam, there is no adoption. And yet, these people who kind of adopted me in their family, there was no papers or something, because I wanted to be a Muslim missionary. I became a Sunni Muslim, and also they got me a job as well, because I didn't want to be on their stipend. And reference makes a big difference. So here I am working <laughs> as a 17, 18 years old, <laughs> as an assistant inspector for in the sensor board. See how God knows how to connect the dots. We have to think the way he thinks. Or if we can't think, just let him do the job. So the Bible interprets the death of Jesus together with his subsequent resurrection as a victory. Oh yeah. And that evening, God, through him, he got the glory. I was saved. I come back to Karachi, the port city of Karachi or Pakistan. And the next day I told my missionary friends, well, I lost my family name. I'm just left with Masood. And he said, from today you will be called Stephen Masood. Little I realized what to do. I have no education very much. I am at, kicked out from the Islamic seminary or cemetery. And here I am, what to do. So I decided to go to the University of Karachi and uh, started studying there as a working student. But one of the thing is the problem or the good problem with the gospel is that once you have tasted, it kind of runs in you to talk to other. You know, have you been to a good restaurant and when you hear somebody is looking for a good restaurant, you want to tell them. What about Jesus? You know, even the Muslims, the Arabs say that if you find water in the desert and keep quiet about it, you have committed the greatest sin on this earth. So here I was, a person who has found food, now wants to tell other beggars where to find food. Have you been to the Mexican area and others and... Uh, as soon as your bus stops, there will be children around. One dollar, one dollar, one dollar, they will try to sell you. And if you don't want it and you just give somebody five dollars, in about five minutes there will be ten more. Because one beggar, uh, one person has told the other people, oh, there is food, there is money. There is money. What about God? What about him? What about this eternity? Let's tell it on the mountains. Let's tell it even in the sea. Even if when nobody hears us, we have to say, he is Lord and he is the only Savior. Tell it to the air. Let it go wherever it goes. Let it go wherever it goes. I beg of you, please, there are people out there. They have no idea. They have no idea. Yes, at least if they even reject it, but they have heard it. They have heard it. They have heard it. Please, please forgive me. I become so emotional about this, but that's me. We should look not only at his crucifixion and death, but also at his victorious resurrection. The biblical picture fits together. Otherwise, look at these references for yourself. You already know. You can read it. You give a copy of the Bible or at least of the New Testament in the hand of that person. Ask him what language you feel more comfortable. Yeah, here in America, many will read English. But if they receive one in Arabic, in Urdu language, other... Please do pray for these translators that they will faithfully, continually put together scriptures which 
still needed to be translated. Pray for them. I thank God that the Bible was available to me in Urdu language that I could read and I could understand. So, coming here, yes, Muslims do believe in the second coming, that Jesus will break the cross and kill the pigs. He will deny his lordship. As I mentioned, cross refers to the Christians and pigs refers to the Jewish people according to the car pigs and monkeys that's what the area is so the traditions say something like this we can talk about that some other time and some Muslim will say that when he comes back he will deny his lordship being divine Jesus will come back this man Dr. Zakir Naik on uh, uh, this peace TV uh, perhaps you don't know, but uh, Texas is the base of it, uh, Dallas. From there on Peace TV, this man, and there are m many other people who talk. So um, I hope the sound will be okay uh, to be careful. There is a big sound coming. Jesus will come back as a follower of Muhammad. He will deny his divinity and follow Islamic law. Mm -hmm. He will follow the same law of the Quran and the hadith. He will not teach anything new. He will come to testify only to the Christians that I never claim divinity and he will follow the law of the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. Did you hear that? And see, if you do not study the scripture uh, when somebody quotes it to you, you got a big problem. Here is this gentleman talking. He quotes Matthew 7, 22, 23, Ahmadidat, he died uh, some time ago, and Zakir was actually his uh, disciple. Jesus is coming to back to judge you, O Christians. He will say to you, Christians, I do not know you. Why? Because you call him Lord. He is not. You made him God. That is the reason he will deny you. Well, he's coming along to rectify you. And he's telling you in the Gospel of St. Matthew, he says, many will say to me on that day, in his second coming, on his return. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name do many mighty works? They will ask Jesus, didn't we do all these things? We build hospitals, you know, orphanages, and we looked after, after the aborigines, and we looked after the Maoris, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name do many mighty works. What does Jesus say to that? He said, I never knew you. I'm asking the Christians. Answer. You know why? You know why? Because you call him Lord. He is not your Lord. He is not your God. That's the reason. That is the reason. You make him into a God. That's the reason. You did all this? You bloody rubbish. I don't know you. Get away. You're not mine. You don't belong to me. Did you hear that? Now, here is the question. Does Matthew 7, 22 to 23 suggest that Jesus will be upset because he's called Lord by believers? No. See, you have to know the scripture. You have to know the scripture. And not only that very place, but other context as well. Here, the argument in the context is not about the Lordship of Jesus, but not what? Obeying what Jesus has commanded. That's what it is. You want to support it further? Here, in Luke. In the other narrative. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Is he denying his Lordship? No. He's looking at our disobediency. Is there a such word, disobediency? Is it? Disobedient, yeah, just to be disobedient, yeah. <laughs> I'm making Pakistani English here. <laughs> anyway, John 13, 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. So you see, here is a man supported by all the way by Saudi Arabia and millions of dollars he spent in South Africa and other places training all these disciples and now they are all everywhere. Zakir is one of them. Because somewhere they say, oh the Bible is corrupted. So they have, a, oh, they will take just a little and the rest 
does not fit their idea. Okay, I think fast forward, I want to finish uh, quickly. The integrity of the Bible. I hope that uh, you are writing any question if you have, and uh, I can answer those. When it comes to the integrity of the Bible, see, here it comes all. When you press on every time criterion, the Bible, the Bible, the person will say, oh, but your Bible is corrupted. Now the question then comes, was the Bible corrupted before or after the time of Muhammad? Muhammad was born in 571 or some will say 70 AD and died in 632. Here's a question now. Well, documentary evidences we have, there are ample manuscripts evidence that the Bible of Muhammad's time was in content the same as it is now. That is one thing. Second, a Muslim gets big into trouble. That's where I got into trouble as well. Why would God expect from Muslims to believe in what was revealed to Jesus and Moses and make no distinction among them if the scripture were corrupted? Because even a Muslim, like last night I told you, Iman, Amal, both goes together. Belief and action go together. If I say I believe in Jesus and I don't keep his commandments, what's the use of it? It's a problem. Yes, there are situations that things can happen, but he says, come back. Because if you say, I don't sin, you are in big trouble too. So, a Muslim has this problem of explaining passages of the Quran, which vindicates not only the Bible by saying, no changes can there be in the word of God. So if the Bible or the Torah, the gospel and the books of the prophets were once the words of God, and now they are changing, they have been changed by these people, then they were greater from God because your God says clearly here that his words cannot be changed. So you got a big problem here. If it's the same God who gave the Torah and the gospel and all these, how could it be possible? That was my dilemma too and I realized, oh no, there is something more to it. And then I realized, ah, oh, the problem is that it all stops with Jesus. It all stops with Jesus. Here is just a prophet of God by the name of Jesus. As a Muslim I look to, he says, I know where I come from. I know where I'm going. Believe in me and you will have eternal life. And here is Muhammad, the leader of them all, as Muslim I believed, who says, I don't know what will happen to me or to you. If God desires at that day, perhaps he will accept you in his paradise. The only way you can be accepted in God's paradise is by dying for him. My question used to be, so how does one know that a particular war which is taking place in which I'm going to go and kill a few unbelievers or infidels, that that is for God. It could be a geopolitical war. How does one decide? How do you decide about it? And that started changing my mind. That, oh, here is Jesus. He is the good GPS, actually. Of course, I didn't know about GPS in those days. But you have these words, so I use them. That he is the way the intercessor, Shafai. He is the one who can lead me, who can help me, who can take my hand. So why is Jesus the only way? He is the unique in his authority. There is a big list of other things which I'm not saying. It's on your outline. You can read it. He is more than a prophet. He is the word of God. He has revealed God. He is a Zahir. He, how various prophets have foretold the coming of Jesus. We can share that on and on. And he is the great and the only sacrifice. My Muslim friend, you celebrate this Abrahamic sacrifice, yet this Abrahamic sacrifice that God will provide in the future Future, and that future when arrived, Jesus gave his life for you and me. How? Why? All this is a quite a big mystery.
But when we look into the Old Testament time, a Muslim then starts realizing that, oh, so Passover, the book of Leviticus, as now we see the fulfillment in the letter to the Hebrews, that how it refers to all those things which were happening, that it was coming, that Jesus was going to fulfill it once for all. I didn't know about it. But when I was led to, then I realized that, oh, this is different. Show from the scripture that a believer in Jesus has assurance of eternal life. Share what Jesus has said about his uniqueness and the assurance. And of course, Jesus, the only name given under heaven through whom we can be saved. Yes, in the apostles' time, they were asked not to take the name of Jesus in front of them. Today in our churches and uh, so-called churches and other places, you can say the word Lord, but don't very much say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh yeah, my wife was told at one time, you mention the name of Jesus so many times and the name of the Holy Spirit so many times that uh, it becomes nuisance. Oh yeah, yes. <laughs> we have been places where we were not even allowed to open the Bible because they were having an interfaith meeting. What type of interfaith meeting Christians and Muslims got together that only a Muslim was allowed to quote from the Quran, but we were not allowed to quote from the Bible. Anyway, sorry, going here and there. I'm one of those people, we, uh, this is also a training for you. Because when you are talking to Muslim, it will be like a rabbit trail, going this way, this way, and you have to really hold on. <laughs> so, here we are. He is the only one coming back. Muhammad is not coming back. Only Jesus is coming back. But they have these strange, strange ideas. When Jesus comes back, he will ask all these Christians to become Muslims. When they don't, they will all be you know, killed or a lot of things, peace will be established by force. So, yeah, Muslims do believe in peace as long as it's their way, submission. So, and then Jesus will marry, will have children, will later on die, and will be buried next to Muhammad's grave. That's not in the Quran, but it's in the traditions. The Quran only says that he is the sign of that hour which is to come. In other words, the judgment day. Anyway, these are some of the resources you can use, uh, grace, mercy, and justice, who is the Messiah, who is God, and there are some other literature. Before I finish, I want to tell this. If nothing else you remember, if nothing else, just share this. Why do I believe in Jesus only? And not Islam, not Hinduism, not Buddhism, or other. Pin it on the scripture. There it is. He is the only mediator, and because God has spoken through him. Those are references. Salvation is through Jesus only. And then, through first Adam, we lost our eternity. Through second Adam, or last Adam, we are raised again to eternal life. Very simple. You know, I could have said that right in the beginning, and we could have been easily driving home. But maybe the Lord wanted it that way. Here I am. Even my wife was surprised uh, seeing me making all these cries. Please forgive me. Uh, etiquette in outreach. Avoid polemics and wordy arguments. If the Lord has led you, say it. Don't hold it. Otherwise, it will groan in you. Oh yeah, there has been times that it, you know, when would you listen? Oh, yeah. But don't sin in that. I'm glad that he does not treat us like he treated Moses. Oh, yeah. And he treated the couple who lied. Not everybody falls in the church right away when they lie. What a grace. On the day when the law was given, I have said that last night, that very day, more than 3,000 people were killed because they had disobeyed the law. The day when the Holy Spirit came upon people, 3,000 were saved. Oh yes. There was the, the Holy Spirit would come and lead people 
visitation was taking place. And from the Pentecost day, his grace, his mercy, and his Holy Spirit not only visited humanity, but also when we accept him, he resides in us, inhabit us. And here we are, but like a gentleman, he wants to be quiet. Only he speaks when he's spoken to. Oh yeah, I agree with in that type of family too. You should be shut up. Don't say anything. Because I used to ask these questions. Why? Where? When? How? I still annoy a lot of people, including my wife as well. But I thank God for her grace and mercy. Can you imagine? I come from a culture where women were treated just second-class citizen. That culture. A culture where it says, Oh, woman, if the husband is angry with you and he goes to sleep being angry with you, angels in the night send curses upon you, oh, woman. And then, when I became a follower of Christ, and I read in the scripture, men, husband, be careful. Because by being dishonest and upset with your wife unreasonably, God may not hear your prayer. See how Satan twists things around? Because he has nothing to invent and to give you, so he goes back. You know, according to the Old Testament, if a person who is married, this was the Old Testament law, he can, and he divorces his wife, he can, they cannot remarry. There was a problem to it, according to the Old Testament law. What Islam teaches is that if a husband, only husband can divorce. Husband divorces his wife, and then they realize, oh, we were just angry and upset. It's the husband who divorces his wife, and he says, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. And the divorce has taken place. So now what they have to do is, they love each other, can you imagine? They love each other, and they say, oh, so what should we do? And the Islamic law says that woman has to go marry somebody else, go, should go to bed with that man, be divorced, Later on, nine months have to be waited, and then that woman can marry again the husband. Whose fault was it? The husband. Please forgive me, but why is Satan is so against the woman? You know and I know. Right from the garden. Because he knew that a great personality would be coming and will get me. You know, we don't know very much about the last day. God the Father could have told you the date and the time there. He only gave you a sign. A good general never reveals to his enemy all the things. Even to his obedient commanders and all those other only reveals a little bit, a little bit. But tells them, the goal is there. We have to get that. That is the reason. Why? Because Satan wants to know. Remember last night, I think, no, not last night. It was a week ago somewhere else. I mentioned this. What was Satan doing listening to the angels giving the reports. He wants to know what is happening in the spiritual realm from God's side. And so to keep you safe and me, he didn't give much information just to keep. The same is with our kids. Although nowadays in America, we will want to tell them about everything life is all about right when they are little kids. What a shame. Anyway, arguments 
may win a point but lose a hearing. Stephen is reminded this again. There are some points on which you can argue forever without achieving a thing except closing a mind against you. Let's remember, all these other things are just a seasoning, including apologetics. The gospel is the main course. Of course, Muslims have a lot of rethinking to do. They have this ideas at stake as well. Oh, what would my people say? My parents will disown me. This will happen. That will happen. Can I be a secret believer? And some Christian missionaries have said, oh yes, you can be a secret believer. And they think about Nicodemus and all this. Yet Nicodemus identified himself when all other disciples had run away. Yes. So, Tell him, share his ID or her ID in Christ and family of believers. Be ready to help. Ask other Christians to come forward to be in fellowship. Persevere. Rest assured, the word of God does not return wide. The word that goes from my mouth will never return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire. This is what God told this prophet. And so let's be remembered. The mission field is not a thousand miles away anymore. Yes, we should send, but don't forget about your own Jerusalem, your own Judea. There are so many around. You can find, oh yeah, Muslim doctors, Muslim teachers. Go to a gas pump and you will find somebody. All the way from India, Pakistan, or the Middle East, and there are people there. Oh, beautiful are the feet who bring good news. Yes, as a Muslim, they may not like you, but who knows, a time may come that they will. We'll have, uh, I want to be here for a whole evening, uh, but uh, time would not allow. If you have any question, and if I know the answer and I can read your writing, then I will otherwise, uh, okay. They're tired, so. Can the references in Numbers and Leviticus regarding the sacrifices to cleanse us be used to compare the sacrifice of Jesus to forgive our sins? Specifically, the sacrifice for sin. Why not? Yes, we should. Yes. Tell them, or even tell Christians as well about it, that how Jesus once for all. Actually, reading the letter to the Hebrews, you know, if you have a cross-reference Bible, it, it will help you. So you start from there. Of course, there are a lot of books written on those things as well. But nowadays, anything you read on Google search, please be careful what you are reading. Ask the Lord to help you in this. God, I'm here in it for your glory. Yes, there are people who may be speaking to you, even writing in their gifting, but that may not be anointing on them. So let's be careful about these things as well at the same time. Even people like me, ask the Lord, this fellow spoke for these many hours, Lord, would you please help us to know what that's a waste of time? Or is it something for us that we were there? Ask the Lord. Don't just take it from me. Check it for yourself. Pray about it. And so, in case something comes up in your mind later on, uh, on this uh, uh, outline, you have our email address, send it. But some of you may not have written to me before or to us. If the first time you are writing to us on the subject line from anything before on that subject line, type friend. And please don't forget that R, okay? <laughs> Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so f what happens is I have a crawler system, so you are uh, 
Yes, that brother knows about crawler systems. Uh, your letter will come on the top, one of those letters who would have written, and I can respond to you quickly. Otherwise, uh, it will take me about three weeks to respond, because even if all the spam and, and everything I received the first time people, I still have to check them. Uh, who knows? Uh, my system may say it's a spam, but the first time a Muslim has written. So that's what, and that's the way sometimes uh, my system is also attacked and, uh, and don't ask uh, what happens at that time. And uh, yes, I'm still a human being, still trying to beat myself like Paul says, and uh, there are times that I say, Lord, I'm doing work for you, why it happened, all this? Stephen, go outside, have some rest. <laughs> oh yeah, there are times. He wants us, calm down, just sit there. But he does not want you to sit there forever. Oh yes, yeah. Okay, another oh another thing. Yeah. Uh, the one that I understand is, do they consider Muhammad the only author of the Quran? Would they say it was God the author? Or Yes, Muslims believe that God is the author of the Quran. He dictated it, that God dictated piecemeal to Angel Gabriel, and Angel Gabriel would come from time to time and tell Muhammad, this is what God says, quote, end of quote. And then he will, the tradition tell us that he will dictate it to his disciples. There has been times that even he forgot what uh, he has been told or he had been told. And so when Muhammad died, naturally the revelation stopped and then they started quibbling with each other. And I talk about it in my book, The Bible and the Quran, how to put this now whole thing together. So they put a committee together to put the Quran together, and they did. And they did a very good job of it, whatever was available to them. For the next 125 years or 150 years, they kind of uniformed them. They were very good at it. To, this is the Quran we have to follow and all others were burnt and uh, and even the people were put in prison that if they did not want to because they had the hierarchy and uh, that's what happened I talk about it but yes the Quran is very well preserved to prove it whether it is from God or not uh, you have to find for yourself the criterion for us is the Bible and so in the light of the Bible if it is the same God why will he forget certain information which may be very very important and yet not important but that will tell you that this God forgets for example Gideon you know the story of Gideon how the army he had was decreased and then God provided the story this whole victory to them you know, in the Quran, that is attributed to Saul. Now tell me, did God forget? We, you, we forget. Where did we meet? What happened? Like just a while ago, I was talking about Job. Actually, I mentioned about teaching at Village View Community Church on Wednesdays about last days, and I mentioned uh, about it. And I thought perhaps I mentioned it last night. Here, we forget things. He does not forget. This is just one simple information. There are more other things. How is it possible if it is the same, Quran, the same God giving the Quran and the same angel, Gabriel, who came to Mary? And you, I just quoted Luke. He will be the son of God. 600 years later, he comes to Muhammad and say that those people who believe Jesus is the Son of God are blasphemers? Did Angel Gabriel forget? Or did God forget? So yes, coming back to Muslims believe that the Quran is not the word of Muhammad, it is the word of God, like the Ten Commandments given to Moses, in the same way this Quran, each word was given. Muslim will go to the extent to say that even the diacritics 
you know, there are these, uh, like in French language, you have these uh, dots and all those other, those uh, wiggly things on the top of the word and all that. Those diacritics, they are called diacritics, that even they are given by God. That's a big lie, because for three centuries, there were no diacritics. The Quran was only recited from memory to each other. So when you write it, uh, it could be, the meaning will be totally different. For example, if I say, kitab e ka, it means your book. But I am only, only saying kitab e ka, that ka has a diacritic on it, which means you. It could be easily kitab e ki, your book, a lady. Ki, anti, you woman, anta, you man. It's a big problem. And so there are words which had, you just changed the diacritics and it had a totally different meaning. One place it says, yes, the Romans have been conquered. Nowadays that is the translation. But one day they will conquer again. And the word is gulibat rom. But if instead of ghalibat, is you say ghalibat, it's the other way around. The Romans have been conquered. See how Arabic is very near to Hebrew language, but there is a problem. And problem, again, you can see satanic ideas there. Why? Just think about it. Why P is or pay is not in Hebrew language. Think about it. Uh, no, I mean in Arabic. There is in, uh, in uh, uh, pay is in uh, Hebrew language, but not in Arabic. And you come across that how Satan has polluted even the language. What God put asunder to people go and start speaking in other languages, Satan has always worked on it as well. And so we have all these nasty words and all these language problems that you say and sometimes children don't realize what they are. In fact, I saw a billboard and I showed her, I said, is this, I can show this? And she said, no way. But there are American Muslims, they wanted to show it and Anyway, so... Uh, so I, I'm not sure the question she's asking here. How do they reference the book of the law, the Quran, or the additional teachings if you're talking about okay. Sharia as yeah, the law? Yeah, I got it. Yes. They will not say, not nowadays at all. But in the Quran, there are some references which refer to the Old Testament laws as well. But since they are in the Quran, there are about uh, 200 passages in the Quran which talks about how to behave, how to perform prayers, and how to, but not in full. So what Muslims have done is, what Muhammad said, what Muhammad did, what he has been seen doing it, they put all these traditions together. And they call like Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, and several lot of other collections. And they, from them, then Muslims in the first century, second century of Islam, started putting together rules and regulation. Of course, now they were the rulers, so they had to. So they looked to the Jewish laws and borrowed. Muslims' lawyers had been borrowers of the Jewish law Islamicizing them and then putting them together. So they put together what we know as, uh, mm, uh, let's say, uh, how do I translate? Arabic, Urdu, Farsi, uh, those three lines are just uh, coming in my, Lord help me here. Okay, um, so not only they wrote commentaries, not only they wrote uh, all and borrowing from Jewish laws and Talmudic laws, but they never mentioned where they got that information. They tried to attribute them to 
Muhammad. Well, nowadays, knowledge is so much available. Again, the biblical prophecy is fulfilled. The knowledge will be so much that it will be, you know, you can get it, but it will be just here. It will not come here. And so now you can learn that where they got all those information. But they Islamicized them and presented. And so they will, uh, the book of laws were then put together. There are four school of thoughts. And all these laws are, the, the books of laws are there, which if you want to read, you can read them in an Islamic seminary or Darul Uloom and all that. So it's all there. There are books available as well, even in English nowadays. The Islamic law, uh, the law of uh, spirituality, the law of uh, social, the law of business, the law of a lot of other, these school of thought. I can give a presentation on Islamic law sometime if you really wanted to know. You raised your hands. Go ahead. Uh, could you speak? Uh, okay, this is the final. Yeah. The uh, five pillars of, of Islam. Yes. Th that is the stages that uh, an Islamist goes through in his life. Yes, uh, that was the fundamental way of, uh, uh, when it comes to, see there is belief and there is action. So those five pillars of Islam as uh, uh, prescribed by Muhammad, they appear in the Quran as well, but not in one place. So yes, uh, the creed of Islam and then the the prayer and the salah, the, the, not only the prayer, but also the fasting. and. Uh, uh, pilgrimage to Mecca and giving offering that's just the basics of but how to perform those things all that information is not in the Quran at all that's in the traditions and in these Islamic laws you will find for example the Quran only says establish your prayer in the morning in the afternoon in the evening but Muslims perform five times prayer where they do go that for that well they go to those laws or traditions of Islam they find it there. How do you perform your prayer? How you make your uh, way uh, in the direction of Mecca? They used to perform their prayers before in the beginning of Islam towards Jerusalem but then Muhammad stopped it. And so all this is written there that why it was forbidden and why one should be doing, how many sets of prayers a Muslim has to do all these, these are in those laws. Then business type, like for example, a, a Muslim is allowed to have business with, uh, have a partner from Christians and Jewish people. If he does not find a Muslim partner, but as soon as if he finds a Muslim partner, in that profession, he should get rid of that Christian. There has been a case in Lady Lake. Do you remember that there has been a case of by the name Dr. Ismail? He wanted to get rid of a Jewish doctor which was in the same clinic. They both were partners. And he wanted to get rid of him, so he hired somebody to kill him. And then it was found out. Go online and you can find that information. And I do not know what happened to that case afterward. What was he doing? He was following. Last night I showed you that how all these uh, Muslim uh, hierarchy who are now uh, taking over in, uh, uh, there are two ladies and one man previously who became congressman and all that, uh, congresswoman and uh, also the uh, other house you have in the Senate, uh, they took oath on the Quran. If something happens in their lives and they are told, well, you had oath taken that you will abide by the law of the United States of America. What? No. I Think about Keith Ellison used to be. He still is the uh, I think a general uh, whatever that is in Minnesota. Attorney General, yes. And he took oath on uh, the copies of Jefferson's uh, copy of the Quran. And what he said, w if he's found 
And actually, there is a story behind it. He was found that he was not very good to his wife or something, so the police came. And he told the police, I behave as a good Muslim. I was upset with my wife according to the Quran. The Quran on which I put my hand as a senator, this. So why you want to take me to the police station? Oh, the police station could not do anything about it. See, there are parallel laws going on. And people have no idea what they are, what to do. Well, here's a clear thing. Yes, the Constitution allow you to perform what you are doing, even you practice your faith. But if your faith becomes a danger to this country and the people of this country, then you are in trouble. Very simple. Very simple. If you could do that to, what was that uh, David Koresh? If you could do that to him, why can't you do this to other people? I'm not saying that that was, that was right, what was done. I think she would shut up. Even my dear wife, he, she's a very good manager of me. She's looking at me. She didn't do this time, but anyway, thank you so much uh, for coming this evening. Please do pray for me, for her, because her task is actually bigger than me. Because she faces a problem, how to help this woman who is already now in the clutches of this man. How to help her, how to, how to follow the book of Corinthians now, that who knows, because of you, he may accept. How to do all this? So the only thing that comes to her mind is that yes, there should be boundary. That if he is, according to this country, if he is abusive to you and other, then it's much better to be separated on that. So it's very hard. And so please, help us in this by praying for us that whenever we open our mouth words may be granted to us that to be glorifying to him and to be able to help these people to know that Christ is the only savior still there is a time to come out yes consequences what we do the consequences would still be there we still have the consequences we are facing, you and I are facing what Abraham did. Ishmael. God still is looking into it. And I believe that one day, somehow, even among them, people of Kadar and Nabayut, it's in Isaiah, will worship the Lord. Yes, there are, not all of them. But there will be people, and I thank God for that. Um, there's, there's a book out there um, called Ten Amazing Muslims, and um, it's ten different stories of former Muslims who came to Christ, and Stephen's Buried Alive story is the tenth one. I know he didn't talk about that, but um, it's in that book. And uh, the others are friends of ours, and God is coming to these Muslims in visions and dreams. And personally, I really believe it's because we're too stubborn to go to them and God's got to go to them because he knows that people have had the opportunity and didn't do it. And so, because he knows who really is zealously seeking to know the truth. And so... Yeah, let's you, be everybody. reminded that God has not finished with anybody, whether an Israelite, right. whether an Ishmaelite, whether this person or that person. No. We have divided ourselves on the question of what we look like and all this. And yet, we have advanced in so much technology that we know what it's all about. It's nothing to do what we believe. We are people groups, and that is all. And God wants all of us to well, know about him. 
We're all from one blood, from Adam through Noah, period. That's it. There's no such thing as, as racial differences. We are all the human race, and that's a lie from the pit of hell. So God is looking for all of us to reach all people. And when someone is in your atmosphere, in your surroundings, then God's brought that person to you for the gospel. Not just to have tea and coffee and have whatever their specialty is, but, you know, to bring the gospel. So let me close in prayer. Is it okay? Is it okay for a woman to pray? <laughs> that was a test for you. So don't laugh at it. How many would say yes? <laughs> oh, Heavenly Father, I praise your holy name and thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice of Jesus for each and every one of us. Thank you. Thank you, Father. You're such a good, good Father. We praise you and we give you glory. And we thank you for this salvation and this privilege and honor to live in this day, Father, where we're seeing the Word of God open up before us, Lord, as the signs of the end are here. Lord, the seasons are clear. And Father God, we just pray that each and every one of us will not just sit on this, Lord, not walk around like a library with all this information. Lord God, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you will stir the hearts of every person here to realize how deceived these Muslim people are, Father God, and that we would be willing to reach the Muslim that's near us, to reach the Muslim that's a doctor, that's a, at the gas station, Lord, that are our relatives or friends or friends of friends. Father God, that you will just stir their hearts, Lord, to bring the gospel to the Muslims and all the lost. But Lord, we just praise you and we thank you that you will use this to produce fruit. We pray all of this and ask you to protect everyone on their journey home, Lord God, until we see each other again. And Lord, just use us mightily for your glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you.